Mazatlan is known as La Noche Triste, the sad night. It should only be the sad night for the Spaniards. It's the happy night for the Indians. I mean, it should be a date to celebrate because they defeated the Spaniards. Once outside the city, Cortez and the surviving members of his expedition gathered beneath what is now called the Tree of Sorrows. Here, Cortez showed his true mettle. He challenged his tired and disheartened troops, calling on their reputations as men, as Spaniards and as conquistadors. Cortez vowed that they would return to Tenochtitlan and be victorious. Cortez and his troops retreated to the safety of an allied city. They'd recoup, rebuild, and prepare for a final assault on Tenochtitlan. Now, Cortez realized he had to control the lake around Tenochtitlan. Using native labor supervised by a Spanish shipbuilder, he had many small, swift vessels built to counter the Aztec war canoe. While his armada was being built, Cortez decided that a victory over a local tribe would boost the morale of his troops and re-establish him as a warrior to be feared. On 1 August 1520, Cortez sent a message to the chiefs of Tipiaca, giving them an opportunity to surrender. The chiefs replied, go away or we'll eat you. Two days later, the Spaniards and the Clas Collins attacked and it was another massacre. It highlighted the lethal efficiency of this combined force. What the Spaniards were doing was being used as the spear point that would punch through opposing forces and allow the Indian forces to actually exploit those breaches. The massacre at Tepeyaca showed an ever more determined and ruthless Cortez. Little by little, he became tougher and he ended up being cruel. After the sad night, he was infuriated against Mexico. He was a very tough and cruel man. In the summer of 1520, Hernán Cortés received three very welcome surprises. The first was the arrival of a small expedition of 200 Spaniards who eagerly joined his army. The second surprise was a very large ship from Spain sent by Cortez's father. It carried much needed supplies, including muskets, crossbows, and more horses. The third surprise was a new and unexpected weapon, smallpox, which the Spaniards had unknowingly brought to Mexico. It had already killed tens of thousands in the Aztec capital. Among those killed by the virus was Montezuma's brother, Quitlawa. His cousin, Cuauhtémoc, became the new Aztec emperor. In the spring of 1521, Cortés and his replenished army returned to the Valley of Mexico. He begins to win allies around the lake, one by one, to come over to his side for the final attack of Tenochtitlan. The siege of Tenochtitlan began. There are only three major causeways that go into this city and the Spaniards built 13 brigantines, mounted a cannon in each one, and basically were able to cut off the city from supplies from outside. The conquistadors and the Tlaxcalans made daily raids into the city. As the Spaniards and their allies fought their way into the city over a three month period, they started laying waste to all the buildings because if they didn't, they would be attacked from those very buildings the next time they pulled in. During the 80-day siege, Cortez's strategy crippled the Aztecs. Smallpox continued to ravage the population, and the naval blockade prevented the Aztecs from getting food or supplies. Even when the Aztecs knew their city was lost, the Emperor Cuauhtémoc could not bring himself to surrender to Cortez. He was captured while trying to escape on 13 August, 1521. After two and a half years, his mission was accomplished. Cortez was the conqueror of Mexico. The old temples will be destroyed and the new church and municipal buildings will be built right in the very center of Mexico Tenochtitlan. And this becomes Mexico City, the center of this great viceroyalty 
that is called Nueva España, New Spain. Part of Cortez's philosophy for New Spain was an intentional mingling of native and Spanish blood. A biological alliance was created between the conquerors and the conquered. Cortez himself had a child by Doña Marina, his native mistress and translator. They establish a society wherein the sexual union is part of the base of that encounter, which is totally different from other types of colonization. Cortez had this castle built for him just outside of Tenochtitlan. From this hilltop, he could survey all that he'd won. He was still under 40, but Cortez was the governor and captain general of New Spain. In 1528, Cortez returned to Spain, where he was granted the title Marquess of the Valley. Though he was initially well received, his new wealth did not buy him the lasting respect he desired. Cortez does return and finds it very difficult to integrate. He would be in Spanish society, the Nouveau Riche. He has the wealth of any grandee of Spain, but is not able to f have the same social contacts or power or anything else that they, these traditional families have. Ironically, Cortez had to defend himself against charges that he acted illegally in Mexico. Some members of his expedition even testified against it. Despite the conquest and its aftermath, the spirit of the Aztecs lives on today through those intent on preserving their culture. They make dishes using Aztec cooking methods. In modern Mexico City, Aztec dancers commemorate their heritage by performing the rituals of their ancestors. They maintain their traditions, along with some resentment for Cortez. He is a very controversial character. To the Mexicans, he represents that ambivalence, the presence of the destructive European. But he is also the great European warrior, the conqueror. For Cortez, the conquest of Mexico proved to be his greatest achievement. He'd personally won more land and treasure for Spain than any other individual. Aztec gold, copper, and rare gems would be mined for centuries. The native people would convert to Christianity and the entire Aztec Empire would become New Spain. And Cortez would be hailed as one of the greatest conquerors in history. There's no question that Cortez is an extraordinarily important figure in the 16th century. He is clearly a world figure of world importance. Cortez had military experience and was himself quite an effective soldier. He was a talented leader, although rather draconian, and in terms of the conquest, probably the luckiest person who ever lived. For his military decisions, Cortez will always be an object of intense study. He got some lucky breaks, like being mistaken for a god, but each time he got lucky, he had good planning and nerve to back it up. And he had the leadership skills to keep his unruly soldiers of fortune on the paths to glory. Add to that superior weapons, psyops, smallpox, and those all-important local allies, and he was unbeatable. Hernan Cortez was a gambler, a charmer, and a warrior. Above all, he was a great conqueror. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Thanks for watching.